Uh, Take your Bibles, if you would, with me this evening and turn to Amos chapter 2. Stewards of Redemption. Last time we were together in the prophecy of Amos, we stepped for the first time into God's words of judgment against the northern nation of Israel itself. In that judgment, God rebuked them for selling the righteous for silver and the poor for a pair of shoes, for oppressing the righteous, for oppressing the poor and the vulnerable for the sake of money and of power. And through this, we talked about the depth of wickedness reflected in a society that goes about to oppress the poor, the righteous and the vulnerable for the sake of money. And this week we continue very much in this context. And we consider together this evening another hallmark of what we could understand to be a judged society, uh, of a society that that, that is soon to be under judgment, and one, again, that hits perhaps a little bit close to home for us in the society in which we live. I do encourage you to take heart, as we talked about last week, however. We talked about the nature of God's judgment and how the prototype for that is Sodom and Gomorrah. And then we thought about Amos and his day, and uh, we think about our own day as well and, and, and the similarities, and yet we recognize that God does not destroy the righteous with the wicked in such judgments, and that just perhaps Legacy Baptist Church might be a part of that remnant that can stand in the gap between us, our culture, and the judgment of God. This week, as we think through more of these hallmarks, is perhaps going to draw us a little bit closer, not just to our society, but closer to the Christian church, closer to home for us, closer to who we are and where we are at Legacy Baptist Church, as we think about God talking to Israel about their own redemption. Now, verse 9 is where we're starting this evening, but it steps very, very much into context. So I'm actually going to go back and I'm going to start reading at verse 6 of Amos 2, and then we'll continue to read uh, through verse 9 and walk through our text together. So the Bible says this beginning in verse 6 of Amos chapter 2, Thus saith the Lord, For three transgressions of Israel and for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof. Because they sold the righteous for silver and the poor for a pair of shoes, that pant after the dust of the earth on the head of the poor, and turn aside the way of the meek. And a man and his father will go in unto the same maid to profane my holy name. And they lay themselves down upon the clothes laid to pledge by every altar, and they drink the wine of the condemned in the house of their God. So just a a quick recap here in verses 6 through 8. God listed in the characteristic 3 plus 4 format that we're familiar with at this point, the transgression of Israel that more or less tipped the scales of his judgment that they oppressed the poor, the vulnerable, and the righteous for money. They were a wealthy nation who had become more loyal to their own luxury than, than to the people that were around them, and thus at the expense of the people that were around them pursued that wealth and that luxury. This made them proud. This made them dismissive of their own history and callous to consequences. Then in verses 9 through 11, God goes about to remind them of the relationship that he has had with them, of his faithfulness to them, and his blessings upon them. So look at this in verse 9. The Bible says, Yet destroyed I the Amorite before them, whose height was like the height of the cedars, and he was strong as the oaks. Yet I destroyed his fruit from above, and his roots from beneath. God first reminds the nation of Israel of his destruction of this group called the Amorites. Now, the Amorites were a representative people of the land of Canaan. When Abram went into the land of Canaan, uh, even as we studied this morning, the Bible says, and the Canaanites were already in the land. Okay, so they were the Canaanites. But what we're going to find as we continue in, in Genesis, in fact, in Genesis 15, God will say, in, God will make promises to Abram. And within the scope of those promises to Abram, he promised Abram that there was going to be a time when God would give them the land. He said, however, that it would be about 430 years later. And the reason why God said it would be 430 years later was specifically because he says, the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. 
So the Canaanites were in the land, and yet we see this group called the Amorites, which was more representative of all of the people within that land that we know as Canaan. And th those people had been in the land since the days, well before, in fact, Abram. Now, the Amorites were also the first on the list of six nations that God promised to drive out from before the nation of Israel in Exodus chapter 34, verse 11. He cites the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and then the Jebusites. So the Amorites were a very strong and a very proud people in their day, just as Israel was a strong and proud people in the days of Amos. Israel at this time was at the height of their power, at the height of their influence, at the height of their wealth. And yet the Amorites were, were a people that God destroyed. He describes them as a tree and he said their height was as the height of the cedars. That would probably be the cedars of Lebanon, which were massive trees and their strength was that of oaks. So using both of those analogies of a tree uh, to, to show the, the tremendous both uh, uh, breadth of their empire and strength of their empire in its day. And yet God says both from above and beneath, using that picture of the tree, both from the top of the tree destroying its fruit and from the bottom of the tree destroying its roots, God had destroyed the Amorites. Now, there's something very interesting about God's description of this judgment. Because if I were reading this just as an objective third party outside of context, and I knew that God was warning Israel of judgment, and then he says, I destroyed the Amorites who were before you, I would think, okay, this is a, this is a warning, right? I destroyed them, and now I'm coming after you. Don't think that you're stronger than them. If I destroy them, I can destroy you too. But what's fascinating about this is that actually isn't why God wrote this verse. He didn't write this verse to warn them that, that they're going to suffer the same fate as the Amorites. God is not reminding Israel of the Amorites to warn them that they're next. He's reminding Israel of the Amorites to cause them to consider just how good he has been to them. Look at verse 10. Also, I brought you up from the land of Egypt and led you 40 years through the wilderness to possess the land of the Amorite. God isn't telling them that the Amorites were a great and powerful people that were strong and were mighty and the influence of their empire to show them. And I crumpled them and I'm going to crumple you too. Instead, God says, I destroyed them in judgment so that you could have their land. I removed them from the land for their wickedness so that you could have that land. I gave their land to you. You could never get that land from them, Israel. You were a small people. You were not a strong people, but I drove them out of the land. I judged them and removed them so you could have that land. And we see that idea in verse 10 here. He says, I brought you out from Egypt. I redeemed you with a mighty hand. He led them through the 40 years in the wilderness in faithfulness. And he did so to, that they might possess the land out of which God had driven the Amorites. God destroyed their might. He cut them down in order that Israel might inherit that land. Described by God in Exodus chapter 23, verses 27 through 30. God said, I will send my fear before thee and will destroy all the people to whom thou shalt come. And I will make all thine enemies turn their backs unto thee. And I will send hornets before thee, which shall drive out the Hivite, the Canaanite, and the Hittite from before thee. I will not drive them out from before thee in one year, lest the land become desolate and the beasts of the field multiply against thee. By little and little, I will drive them out from before thee until thou be increased and inherit the land. All of this God did in faithfulness to his people Israel. All this and more. 
You say, well, pastor, that does not sound very fair. But remember what I just cited in Genesis 15. We'll come there in, in the morning services and not, not too long from now. And when we get there, what we're going to find out is that the whole reason why God told Abram, I can't give you the land today, it's going to be 430 years before I can give you the land, was because, he says, the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. God says, today I can't give you the land because the... the uh, there, my, the, the, the cup of my wrath, the cup of my judgment has not yet been filled and I cannot justly remove these people from the land. But in 430 years, they will have utterly rejected me, at which point they will be ready for judgment. And then when I bring you into this land, then it can be yours because of this people. So God is not being cruel or genocidal or anything of the sort here. The Amorites in that day had lined themselves up for judgment through their wickedness and rebellion. But God did it in the time and in the way he did it specifically so that Israel might inherit the land properly. God continues in verse 11. He says, And I raised up of your sons for prophets and of your young men for Nazarites. Is it not even thus, O ye children of Israel? Saith the Lord. God gave them the land, but he didn't just give them the land. <coughs> Excuse me. Once they had settled in the land, he says, he raised up their sons to serve him within the land. And God speaks of two offices of service here within the text. The first one is the prophet. The prophet was the man who proclaimed the word of the Lord before the ears of the people. He was the man who called the people back to the Lord when they strayed. He raised up men to proclaim his word in a manner that the people could both hear and understand, to learn and to obey. This is a mark of God's faithfulness. God did not just bring them into the land, give them the land, and then abandon them in the land. He kept his word alive in the land into which he sent them. He did not just say, well, you've got my law, figure it out. He sent men to faithfully proclaim the word of the Lord, to show signs and wonders, to validate his word. He remained faithful to them all throughout that time and not just through the prophet he said second as well the Nazarite now the word Nazarite simply means separate and it spoke of a vow which was taken and, and incidentally as it relates to the Nazarite God says here he raised up your young men for Nazarites which is true um, but the Nazarite vow could be taken by a man or a woman according to the text in Numbers God teaches of this law in Numbers chapter 6. He describes his expectations of them. In Numbers 6, verses 2 through 8, the Bible says this, Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, When either man or woman shall separate themselves to vow a vow of a Nazarite to separate themselves unto the Lord, he shall separate himself from wine and strong drink, and shall drink no vinegar of wine or vinegar of strong drink, neither shall he drink any liquor of grapes or eat moist grapes or dried. All the days of his separation shall he eat nothing that is made of the vine, uh, excuse me, of the vine tree, from the kernels even to the husk. All the days of the vow of his separation there shall no razor come upon his head until the days be fulfilled in the which he separateth himself unto the Lord. He shall be holy and shall not let the locks of his hair of his head grow. Excuse me, and shall let the locks of, his, of the hair of his head grow. All the days that he separateth himself unto the Lord, he shall come at no dead body. He shall not make himself unclean for his father or for his mother, for his brother or for his sister when they die because the consecration of his God is upon his head. All the days of his separation, he is holy unto the Lord. The vow of the Nazarite was a temporary vow of consecration to the Lord. This one who would take the vow would drink uh, no wine or liquor. He would not eat anything, in fact, derived from the vine, or derived from, 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 from the grape. He would put no razor to his head. He would allow his hair to grow. Of course, the most uh, obvious example that we see of this in the scriptures would be Samson. 
He would touch no dead body, not even for the sake of his family, so that during the time of him taking this vow, which was a set period of time, it was a temporary time, but during the period of that time where he would, where he would take this vow, if somebody in his family died, he was still prohibited from touching that dead body because the consecration of the Nazarite vow overrode even the duty that he would have to his family within that time of the vow until the days of his separation ends. And the idea here is that these men and these women, when called uh, and then raised up to take this vow, and it would be something that presumably they would feel a compulsion of the Lord, or in the case of Samson, a prophetic utterance of the Lord, to enter into this vow. In doing so, they would become, if you will, a living testimony to the nation. That though the nation themselves did not necessarily live in such a state of perpetual consecration, that though the nation themselves was not necessarily called by the law to live in this place of, 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 of perpetual consecration, yet when they saw a Nazarite living under this consecrated vow, they would be compelled to remember what consecration and separation looked like. It was a call to be a, as it were, a societal check upon the tendency to the common or profane. Maybe you have uh, met someone in your life that is kind of that way, that they live in a manner they've chosen a set of standards that are very high, and whenever you're around them, you walk away uh, feeling uh, as, as though maybe, may, maybe you're a little bit uh, not, not where you ought to be, Right? And some people take that as a judgment upon them. They feel judged by that or they feel guilty by that. But it's not a bad thing to have people around us that have chosen a higher path. And it's not a bad thing that when we see them and we see what they have yielded for the Lord, and I may not necessarily feel as though I, ne I need to yield those things to the Lord. Somebody who has utterly dedicated themselves to the Lord and all of their time and all of their effort. And if we all did that, then we, would, um, then, 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 you know, not, we wouldn't have jobs and all of these sorts of things because there's some people that utterly dedicate themselves to the Lord. And we look at them and we say, wow, look at them. Look at all they're doing for the Lord. Look at how much time. Look at how much effort. Look at how much consecration. Uh, look at their, their, the... the the high level of living, and it may not necessarily be something for you, but it is a good reminder of what consecration looks like. It is a good reminder of what it looks like when someone is wholly yielded, and that can be inspiring. Such was the Nazarite in his day, a social check against the tendency to drift away from the Lord. So that between the prophet and the Nazarite, God raised up men to be this verbal reminder of God's expectations as well as a visible reminder through the Nazarite of God's holiness and consecration. So in verses 9 through 11 then, God states three facets of his faithfulness and his redemption toward Israel. He drove out the Amorites. He led the nation out of Egypt and sustained them for a generation to give them the land out of which he drove the Amorites. Did I say Nazarites? He drove out the Amorites. If I didn't say Amorites, I meant Amorites. Uh, then, then he drove them out so that he could give the land to Israel, right? Sustain them through the wilderness until he could give them the land. And then he raised up men to be a perpetual reminder, both verbally and physically, of God's word to them in the land. Verse 12, however, takes a very tragic turn. God says, But ye gave the Nazarites wine to drink and commanded the prophets, saying, Prophesy not. What did Israel do with these gifts that God had given to them as a part of their redemption from Egypt? They lived in the land that God gave them by driving out their enemies. They got rich and powerful off of the backs of the Lord's blessings upon them. And then they silenced the word of God among them. They desecrated the sanctity of the Nazarite vow, giving them wine to drink, lest they feel guilty. Because there is someone here who is living in a consecrated manner, and it makes me feel uncomfortable. They silenced the mouths of the prophets. They desecrated the consecration of the Nazarite. God's people, upon becoming wealthy and comfortable no longer had time for God, no longer wanted to hear his word. 
They lost interest in holiness, in sanctification, in separation, in obedience, in submission. Thank you, God, for driving the Amorites out of the land. Thank you, God, for bringing me into the land. I'll take it from here. You've done your part. Now let me live my way. And this kind of backed God into a corner. It brought God to a place where he didn't want to be. That's interesting language to talk about with God. How can we back God into a corner? How can we put God in a place he doesn't want to be? But look what verse 13 says. Behold, I am pressed under you as a cart is pressed that is full of sheaves. God describes himself as an overloaded cart that is maybe sagging in the middle, that is, is, is on its wheels and, 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 and pressed down. If we were thinking of it, of it today, it's that trailer when you're driving down the road and you see a trailer next to you and it's riding its axle. Sparks are flying off of the fenders. That's the idea. God says, I'm pressed under you. He is pressed under the weight of their rebellion. He's straining with all of his long suffering and mercy against their rebellion, straining to allow them to stay in the land and to continue to give them the things that he has promised to them. But God's blessings have been stressed to their breaking point because of their sin. And because of this rebellion and because of this pride, because of this contempt for all that God had given them, by which, having received of God's goodness, they sought to force God out of their lives. God uses the last three verses of Amos chapter 2 to give them a warning. He says in verses 14 through 16, Therefore, the flight shall perish from the swift, and the strong shall not strengthen his force. Neither shall the mighty deliver himself. Neither shall he stand that handleth the bow, and he that is swift of foot shall not deliver himself. Neither shall he that rideth the horse deliver himself. And he that is courageous among the mighty shall flee away naked in that day, saith the Lord. So God warns of judgment. He says that the swift will not be able to flee fast enough to avoid it. The strong will not be strong enough in that day. The might the mighty, excuse me, will not be able to deliver himself, much less through his might deliver another. The archer will not be able to stand. The horse and the rider will not defend. And even the courageous will flee away on that day, utterly destitute. Because the nation forgot the source of their strength. They forgot that their strength was never their own. The source of their blessing had never been their own hand. The source of their blessing had always been the goodness of the Lord upon them. And when they chose in their pride, in their day of, of much blessing, to force God out of the equation, the one that they were forcing out was the only thing they had that commended anything to them. When we, they rejected the Lord, they rejected their strength. When they rejected the Lord, they rejected their might. Because what are God's people, Christian, when at once they have left the side of their God? What's left once we've left the God who has redeemed us? And in fact, that's my question this evening for all of us. What are God's people without their God? This is not only a question for Israel in Israel's day. This is a good question for us in our day as well, isn't it? What are we apart from our God? If we yield the power of God's word as a church... If we sacrifice the distinctions of God's way as a church, if we become pragmatic, if we become selfish, if we say, well, God, you've raised us up. Thank you. We'll take it from here. We can make ourselves grow. We can make ourselves powerful. We can make ourselves influential. We can make ourselves what we need to be now. Thank you for getting us this far. We'll take it from here. Where do we end up? if we yield the power of God's word for luxury, 
If we yield God's holiness for convenience, if we yield submission for the praise of men, what, what are we left? But a hollow shell of what we once were. What we're yielding, Christian, when we do such things is really the only thing that actually matters. When the people of God yield their God without God, what are God's people? You know, we do find ourselves in such a time. In the church, in some ways, much like the days of Amos. Now, of course, we look at society as we think of Amos last week, and we recognize that we are in a society that is rich and bored and lazy. And as a rich and bored and lazy society, we see exactly what the, the scriptures say Amos saw in his day which was this rebellion and sexual perversion and all of those things. Same thing that Sodom saw in their day, rebellion and sexual perversion. And we see that in our society today. But let's just think, let's get a little closer to home. Let's think about the church. It is not just the society around us that has become wealthy and entitled and selfish and apathetic. In many ways, God's people have as well, haven't we? We can't necessarily be bothered with holiness anymore. Surely there must be another way to serve God than actually submit to him. Maybe our money can make up for what we lack in God's presence among us. We're wealthy. Maybe even though God's presence is not necessarily among us, we can work our way into feelings and emotions that are more or less kind of like God's presence. Maybe our emotional sensitivities, if we become an extremely emotionally sensitive group of people, maybe that can make up for the fact that we lack the Spirit's power in our lives. Maybe we can allow empathy to be a stand-in for actual spiritual sensitivity. So we silence the speaker of truth because he speaks inconvenient truths. Because his words don't make me feel the comfort of God's love. They make me feel the weight of my own selfishness. They make me see my lack of humility. They make me understand the deficiencies of the choices I'm making as it relates to God's word. We shame the separated. Making those who have chosen to live a life that is more separated than our own. As to feel as though the only possible explanation for the life of separation that they're leading is that they must be denying grace. And the end result is that we become a powerless people. And you know what the worst part is about it? I think it's probably the worst part about it in Israel's day as well. That as Amos was proclaiming this, I don't know where he was, just, just when he was proclaiming it. We know at one point he was at Bethel. Wherever he was proclaiming this thing, you know what the worst part is about it? Is that as we become powerless as a church, we don't even know it. Like Samson in his day where his hair was cut and he awoke and he went to fight those who had surrounded the house. And the Bible says that he got up like any other day and he moved out not even knowing that the power of God was no longer with him. How often is it that we as God's people, we have replaced God's presence, God's power in our lives with some alternate, whether it be wealth or whether it be, or whether it be a, a functionality or programs or whatever it might be, and we have done so without even knowing what we've lost. And we don't know it specifically because we have silenced and shamed everyone in the church who's trying to tell us. Which means it isn't that we can't know it. Rather, it's because we don't want to know it. The old adage says, ignorance is bliss. Better to live comfortable with a form of godliness that denies the power thereof than to take up our cross and follow Christ. The nation of Israel had been given something incomparable, something incredible, we read of God's deliverance from Exodus. They walked through that Red Sea. Moses struck the rock and water came from that rock and that followed them through the wilderness. They woke up every day and manna was at their doorstep. They rebelled and God was faithful. He fed them for 40 years. For 40 years, their sandals did not wear out. For 40 years, their clothes got no holes in them. Imagine being a parent 
and your child grows up and his clothes are not all tattered. I can't, I can't even fathom, right? My, my boys can't even get through a summer with their clothes not getting tattered. They wandered through the wilderness for 40 years and their clothes didn't wear out. And at the end of that time, God moved them into the land and he moved this mighty people with chariots and walls and giants in the land. And he moved them out of the land so that his people could move into the land. And all of this that God did for them, incredible. They had been protected. They had been provided for. They had been preserved. They had been taught. And when at once their blessings had given way to prosperity and peace, they forgot their God. And Christian, we are not beyond doing the same. In the book of the Revelation of Jesus Christ, God warned several churches against this very thing. In chapters 2 and 3, the letters to the seven churches in Revelation. Ephesus was a church of works. They were a church of labor. They were a church of patience. Those are good things. But the Bible says they had forgotten their first love. And God called them to remember from whence they had fallen and to repent and to do the first works. Pergamos was a church that the Bible says held fast to God's name and had not denied the faith. That's a good thing. But the Bible says that as they endured with the Lord, they also endured the doctrine of Balaam in their midst. They had allowed the doctrine of Balaam to, to have a voice in their midst. And God called them to repent. He said, or else I will come quickly and I will fight against you. Sardis was a church who lived the name of God but was dead. And God called them to remember what they had seen and what they had heard to repent and to hold fast. And then, of course, we're mostly familiar with Laodicea. Perhaps most indicative of the times of Amos, perhaps most indicative of the times of our own churches today. These men and women in Laodicea said this, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. But God says what you do not know is that you are actually wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. And he called them to repent. He said, buy of me gold tried in the fire that you may actually be rich. Symbolizing obedience and works even in the midst of persecution. Because for the people of God, if we aren't doing the works of God, then we aren't doing anything of value. We have nothing to show for ourselves in eternity. God also counseled them that they would put on white raiment that they may actually be clothed. He said that they are naked. That was a part of his condemnation against them. He said, so get white raiment and put that right white raiment on, symbolizing, of course, holiness, separation from the world, the flesh, and the devil. Because if the people of God are not distinct from the world around us, again, that doesn't mean we're always going to look different than the world around us, but if we are not distinct from the world around us, well, then what are we? We may be a chosen people, but if our lives have failed in testimony, if someone cannot look at the church and see a difference in us, see a distinction in us, see that we treat one another differently, see that we operate differently, see that we think differently, see that we love differently, see that we trust differently, see that we do things in this distinct manner, well, then what are we? We may stand before God one day clothed in Christ's righteousness, but on the earth, have we shamed the name of Christ by simply living like the world, by looking exactly like them, by doing things the same way they do? Now, where I'm going with this is the end of God's exhortation to Laodicea. Laodicea excuse me. And in Revelation chapter 3, verses 19 and 20, God wrote this. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Christian, God does not correct you because he hates you. 
God corrects us because he loves us. But that doesn't mean God's love demands rebuke. If we would be zealous and repent, we could live in God's love manifest in blessing and provision and power rather than God's love manifest in chastening and rebuke. And we know that God is willing. God is standing at the door knocking. This is not a verse written to unbelievers. Perhaps we've used this verse before talking about God knocking at the door of someone's heart into salvation. And that's fine, you know, using a little bit of license there, but that's fine. But that's not what God is saying here. He is standing and knocking at the door of a church and saying, will you let me into your church? I'm standing at the door and I'm knocking. And if any man will hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and I will sup with him and he with me. There will be fellowship. God is knocking. And if we will but open the door, if we will but repent and align, if we will but be zealous for our Lord, he will come in and he will sup with us and we with him. And to whatever extent the church is lacking in power and provision and effectiveness, this we know for sure. It's not because God is unwilling. It's because we've closed the door. Let us not despise or scorn our redemption today as Israel did in their day. Let us not continue in sin that grace may abound. Let us not shy away from the cross of holiness, from the cross of submission, from the cross of separation, from the cross of purity. Let us instead be good stewards of our redemption, living out in our lives a reflection of the redeemed. Peter exhorts this in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 through 12. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Okay, so that's the call Notice what he beseeches us then in verse 11. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims. That's who we are. We are passing through. We are pilgrims on a journey. We are strangers in this earth. We are ambassadors for another kingdom. And as those strangers and pilgrims abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against the soul, having your conversation, that's not just speaking of the words that are coming out of your mouth, it's speaking of your entire deportment, the things you say, the things you do, your conversation, the entire way in which you present yourself to another, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles. The Gentiles here not necessarily meaning non-Jewish people, but rather those who are unbelievers, those who are outside of the grace of Jesus Christ. Having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, we're getting a lot of that today as Christians, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. This is not saying that through your good works, all of those people that hate you will fall on their knees and accept Christ as their Savior. What this is saying is that through your good works, on the day of judgment, when those people are there terrified before a holy God and saying, God, what do you mean I was supposed to believe in you? When did you show yourself to me? I never read the Bible. I never read a tract. And they're going to say, you know those people you hated and persecuted? You remember their good works in the face of all of that? That was the testimony of me. What if we lose our savor? What if our light is under a bushel? What if our good works have been replaced? What if our distinction has been replaced with a wealthy, idle, and lazy group of people who have taken the redemption that God has given to us and said, thank you, Lord, I appreciate that. I'll take it from here. And we shove him out of our churches. 
What are we, Christian, without our God? And then what does our day of visitation look like? If we are a people called out of darkness into God's marvelous light, and we are, if we were in times past not a people, but now are the people of God, and we are, if you've accepted Christ as your Savior today, if we have had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy, and we have, well then, dearly beloved, live as strangers and pilgrims. Abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. Live honestly among the world that is around you that you may be a testimony of the living God and glorify God among those, even those that may speak against you as evildoers. And the question for each of us this evening is this. Are we living in a manner that reflects disdain upon our own redemption? Or are we being good stewards of the redemption that we have received? I'm not here questioning whether or not you are one who has accepted Christ as their Savior and entered into that redeemed people that, that 1 Peter 2 speaks of. My question is this. You are one of the redeemed. If you are one of the redeemed, are you living like it? We state unambiguously that we are the redeemed. But is our manner of life as unambiguous as it relates to our redemption as our words are unambiguous? Or have we, God forbid, silenced the prophets among us? Have we, God forbid, shamed those who have been called to live a separated life? Are we so rich and so increased with goods that we in our own minds feel as though we have need of nothing and have failed to realize that we are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Let us buy that gold which has been tried in the fire, Christian, that we may be rich. Let us clothe ourselves in that white raiment, Christian, that we may be clothed. Let us anoint our eyes with that eye salve, Christian, that we may see. Let us not be like the people in Amos' day, the people of Israel, that were such poor stewards of the redemption that they had been given, as God had moved out their enemies and settled them in the land and, done for, and raised up prophets and raised up Nazarites and they silenced the prophets and they gave the Nazarites wine to drink and they said, God, thank you for your redemption. Now we'll take it from here. Let us instead be the people of God that God has redeemed us to be. If we are the people of God, let's live like it this evening. Thank you for listening to Pastor Jamin Wickler from Legacy Baptist Church in Buffalo, Minnesota. More information about Legacy Baptist Church and a library of sermons are available at www.legacybaptistchurch.net.